All right. Glad to be back, Hard Rockers. How's everybody doing out there? Time to talk about the next rat offering in the catalog, 1986's Dancing Undercover. Dancing Undercover, as most of you will no doubt know, is the third studio album released by Rat. Um, it was released August 9th, 1986, and it was the third straight Rat album produced by Bo Hill. It contains the hit single and video for the song Dance, um, which also appeared in the Miami Vice episode Down for the Count. Two other videos were made. Uh, one was Slip of the Lip, and the other was Body Talk, which was actually used, if you don't know this, um, for the soundtrack of Eddie Murphy's film, The Golden Child. And um, a little more on that later. Um Dancing Undercover peaked at number 26 on the Billboard 200 albums chart and at number 14 on Rolling Stones album chart. Don't ask me how they got that far off, but whatever. Rolling Stone was involved, so I'm assuming it was some kind of Tom Fuckery. The album was certified platinum in 1987. Uh, on a somewhat random note, Early pressings of the CD had Slip of the Lip and Body Talk errantly mastered into track four as one track. So there was technically no track 10 on that CD, if you get my drift. Rat's opening acts on the Dancing Undercover tour uh, included Poison, Cinderella, Cheap Trick, Queensryche, and Vinnie Vincent Invasion. Okay, so there are many things I love about Dancing Undercover. Um, I haven't quite decided after all these years if the cover is one of them. I really think it is. I like this cover. Uh, I think it's cool. I think it catches your eye when you walk in the store. Um, I like the black and red. Nice combo. And um, I don't like this. Now, it may not be for the reason you think. I'm not so lifelong vehemently anti-smoking that I hate the cover because of that. Uh, I, in fact, smoked for about 25 years earlier in my life, and I hate that because as a smoker, when I saw this picture, all I could think when I saw that thing smoked almost entirely down to the butt was, ew, that stinks and it tastes bad. I mean, if you want an appealing shot of a cigarette, have it be like at least half of the cigarette. I, I don't know why we couldn't do that. This just makes me feel like the album's going to smell bad and taste bad. Anyway, 10 tracks. Um, uh, one of the other things I love about the album is that it has a bit of that edge that I complained in Phasing of Your Privacy had been lacking, for me at least. It's also sonically very pleasing to my ear. Um, I find several, well, let's just go ahead and call it all of these songs really enjoyable to listen to. And I think, as with Out of the Cellar and Invasion, the production overall is pretty spectacular. One big favor that Bo Hill did for this band was make their albums sound really consistent and really good. These albums are fairly loud for the time, really well mixed, and these are great sounding recordings of all the instrumentation. And of course, with all Rat albums, that guitar. 
guitar sound. Wow. Um, consistent was something I think rap really tried hard to be uh, and something that they considered very important. That said, I think one of the best things about this album is that consistency in the songwriting, the recording, and the overall personality of these songs. Again, consistency being the key word when it comes to dancing undercover. The main thing that stands out about this album to me in a good way is that almost nothing stands out on it as you're about to see. But that's also kind of one of the worst things about the album in a bad way. Nothing really stands out. Okay, that said, let's take a look at these tracks. Track one, dance. Written by Robin Crosby, Stephen Piercy, Warren Demartini, and Bo Hill. This is totally a five-star rat song. This is just so awesome. This is how you open an album, gentlemen. Bravo. Had they opened Invasion with something more like this and put You're in Love somewhere else, like maybe the side two opener? That long-ass Invasion review I just did about a week ago is a whole different ball of kitty litter. I remember Warren saying in interviews that he'd sort of stolen that lead guitar thing at the beginning of this track from Pete Townsend and The Who's Baba O'Reilly. And I can definitely hear that. It's a, such a cool guitar piece. I'm going to go ahead and say right here something that I catch myself thinking a lot when I listen to this album. How can this possibly be the album right after Invasion of Your Privacy? It just hasn't ever seemed to fit there for some reason. I almost always find myself thinking this came or should have come right after Out of the Cellar when I listen to it. Somehow the idea that Invasion could have possibly come in between these albums just makes no sense to me. Another thing I have to say about Dancing Undercover, I think it's my favorite and the best overall Stephen Piercy vocal performance of any Rat album. I'm not sure if I really feel that way or not, but when I listen to the album, I just feel like Piercy's vocals have never been tighter or smoother. I guess it could just be something about the songs. I'm not sure. So did I say this song is awesome? Yeah. Okay. Glad I got that out there. Track two, One Good Lover. She's got the looks of the picture book. Written by Robin Crosby and Stephen Piercy. I gave this one four stars. It seems to be mostly ignored when people talk about the album, but I really enjoy this one. It's not a favorite overall rap song by any means, but I do like it when it comes on. Track three, Drive Me Crazy.
This one was written by Robin Crosby, Stephen Piercy, Warren Demartini, and Bobby Blotzer. Uh, this has really got a cool, heavy riff. This was probably my least favorite track on the album for a long time when it first came out. I no longer feel that way. I'm not sure why I ever did. It's a cool tune. Robin Crosby plays the solo on this song. That's something you won't be hearing me say very many more times in these reviews. In fact, only two more times, according to all the information I've found and my own ear. Again, Warren was and is my favorite guitarist from the entire 80s. But I think Robin not getting more solos just sucks. Anyway, four stars. Track four, Slip of the Lip. Written by Warren Demartini, Juan Crucier, and Stephen Piercy. This song was a single and got a video on MTV. I mean, Dance got a video too, and so did Body Talk, but for some reason, this was the video I saw played on almost every video channel I used to watch back then. I like the song. I don't really love the song anymore, though. Although I think I did when this came out. I love the solo by Warren. Four stars. Track five, Body Talk. Written by Warren Demartini, Juan Crucier, and Stephen Piercy, again. Okay, here is exactly what I was looking for and didn't get on Invasion of Your Privacy. Anywhere. A song like this, this fast, this aggressive, this inspired, would have made a huge difference in how Invasion felt to my friends and I back in 1985, and how it has aged for me in the years since. I'll never forget going to the movie theater to see the Eddie Murphy film The Golden Child and literally seeing the live concert footage sections of this music video play on some little TV in a room in a dark house while Eddie was fighting some bad guys. I was sitting there with my popcorn thinking, to hell with Eddie Murphy and these other dudes, get back to that TV. Incredible song. Much needed type of song for these guys at this point. Five stars. Great screamy vocal by Steven. Fantastic guitar riff. Warren sounding like Torch again for one of the few times on any album after Out of the Cellar, really. Did I say this is amazing? No, this song is amazing. Clearly, I'm not the only one who feels that way about it either. This song gets a lot of internet love. If that's important to you at all. Track six, and the first song on side two, Looking for Love. Written by Robin Crosby, Juan Crucier, and Stephen Piercy. 
I really like this one. I gave it four stars, but go back and listen to it again and listen specifically to Juan's bass line. I don't know if Juan came up with that whole bass line himself or if he had any help from the band or Bow Hill or whatever, but that's a really cool bass line, just all over the place. Juan was a really good bassist who almost never gets any credit for his bass playing. Juan also had a hand in writing every song on this album after the first three tracks. This is the other Robin Crosby solo on the album, and as far as I know, his second to last solo in the Rat Catalog. One of the best things about Rat when they came out to a lot of us fans was that they were a two guitar band among a ton of one guitar bands that had come out in the early 80s. Now, that was basically gone. According to the Full and Bloom interviews, specifically one with Jim Faraci, who engineered some of Rat's albums for Bow Hill, that was basically Robin's own choice. I remember the day, and I, I was, it was sad when Robin, you know, said, you know what, I think I'm done playing on the records. You know, because he, he looked at me and said, ah, just let the little guy do it. And that's on Dancing Undercover? Yeah, that was on the third record. And, and by that time, I mean, Warren's an incredible guitar player. Oh, he's and a guitar he, hero. And better with every record, he'd be like, oh my God, well, look what he's doing now. If you thought he was good before, look, and Robin realized that, said, let's make the best record we can make. I'm more than happy to write the songs and keep all these guys in line. That's my role. He, he took on his role in the band. All of this is a real shame. Even if Robin hadn't had the drug problems and gotten HIV and eventually died, it's just a real shame. I've said probably in nearly every rap video I've made here so far that Rat was stronger with Robin than without him by a mile. I think they needed Robin's leadership. And once it had faded into the background, the band started to fade with it. What a waste. Robin was the one guy you could, you know, every band has the one guy who you go, okay, I got five opinions. Now let's go to the guy who knows what's going on. That would be Robin. Robin would come in and go, no, man, this is what it should be. All right, let me go talk to Steven and then I'll talk to Juan and I'll get all this shit settled. So Robin was, that's why he was king. Because Robin was the king of the band. Robin didn't have an ego. Robin wanted the best for the band. Track 7, 7th Avenue. Written by DeMartini, Piercy, and Crucier. Okay, so side two of this album is strangely interesting to me. And always has been. In fact, the whole album is one of those albums that I literally just cannot seem to listen to only once when I get it out. And yes, that's because I love it, but that's also because these songs all just sort of seem to blend together for me. Maybe the only exception to that is the opener, Dance. That song sticks out as really exciting and fun. And then the rest of the album, while I love it and enjoy each song, just sort of seems to play in my mind as one continuous track with almost nothing that jumps out and grabs my attention. So after I listen to it, I'm always like, wait, 
I feel like I missed half of that. Now I got to hear it again and pay better attention. So I put it on again and try to pay better attention and I get lost all over again. Now, I'm not saying I don't like any of these songs. I've given them all four stars so far and a couple of them five stars. And I'm giving this one four stars. But they just aren't really all that memorable to me for whatever reason. In fact, most of the time, unless I've just finished listening to the album, if you asked me to tell you how each of these songs goes on side two, like which one had which riff, I probably couldn't do it. But when I hear them one at a time, I'm going to enjoy each of them and tell you how cool it is. I don't know. Got me. I just know it's true for me. Track eight, it doesn't matter. Written by Juan Crucier and Stephen Piercy. Okay, I'm just going to say this is my favorite track of the side two tracks. It still gets four stars, not five, but I really like it. Another great Demartini solo, of course. Track nine, Take a Chance. Written by Demartini, Crucier, and Piercy. Another side two song, another cool riff, another cool Piercy vocal, another great rhythm track, another four stars, but another song I can barely remember any specifics of an hour later. I totally dig it, it just doesn't stick with me. And finally, track 10 Enough is Enough. Written by Demartini, Crosby, Crucier, and Piercy. I love that acoustic intro. I love what they do with it. It's a really great Piercy vocal melody. Probably one of the more interesting and exciting tracks on the album, honestly. But then when I see the title, the next time I look at the track list, I'm like, uh, I think... I think I really liked that one, didn't I? Now, I just listened to the album again before recording this, so I know I like it. Really. It's like some kind of weird brain drain thing that happens when I'm done listening to these. <laughs> I don't know. Got me. And yet, I almost went five stars with this one. I wound up with four, but it was close. Again. Dancing Undercover is easily one of the most consistent albums I've ever heard, from track to track, all the way through. My favorite track, it is and always has been the album opener, Dance. I know, a lot of people would likely say Body Talk, and it is great. If I simply must pick a least favorite, I seriously cannot. I've tried, I really have. I just can't pick one. I like them all. I only love a few. I can't separate them any better than that. So why was Dancing Undercover 
just another step down in the declining sales of the rap albums. Well, as I've complained about in each of these videos so far, guys in suits. That's why. In a recent article that was posted by Ultimate Classic Rock, uh, the band's decline was talked about for the anniversary of Dancing Undercover's release. And I'm just going to read this to you because I really think it's very telling. In the article, drummer Bobby Blotzer said in a 2010 interview with the House of Hairs Ray Van Horn, quote, we weren't prepared for that record and it's common knowledge. Our manager put a $50,000 deposit on a studio and it wasn't refundable, which is what he told us. We weren't ready. We were in a very costly recording studio, writing songs and working them out. End quote. In other words, Rat were under much pressure and time constraints to deliver the goods yet again. And that helps explain why their third album, full length album, lacked that home run hit and tellingly, adds the article, a power ballad to guarantee the sales and airplay they'd grown accustomed to. Instead, singles Dance, Slip of the Lip, and the surprisingly heavy Body Talk failed to rise any higher than number 59 on the chart and received only moderate MTV spins. Despite what I've said about seeing Slip of the Lip video played everywhere all the time for a while. Uh, but what I really noticed was body talk and dance weren't. In any case, Rat's gradual career decline was evident to anyone who was paying attention, or who could do the math. Out of the Cellar had gone triple platinum, Invasion of Your Privacy had gone double platinum, and Dancing Undercover ground to a trickle just beyond the single platinum mark. While this would have been a lofty, coveted sales figure to most any other band, you didn't have to be a statistician to predict which way Rat's career was trending. Dancing Undercover came to epitomize the beginning of the end. Perhaps Bobby Blotzer summarized it best in the interview with Van Horn, quote, while there's some songs I really like on Dancing Undercover, there's stuff I can't even listen to. I just think there's stuff on there that's really subpar. But then again, that record sold 1.8 million, so I can't snub my nose at it. I just think we could have done better, obviously, end quote. And that's the end of the article. Now, I'm not sure which songs Bobby Blotzer thinks are so bad on Dancing Undercover that he can't even listen to them. I certainly don't hear any of them that way. But for the most part, I can't really dispute any, anything else that the article had to say. Either way, it sounds very much to me like what I already said in the review I did before this one for Invasion of Your Privacy. A record label and manager being in too big a hurry to get another record out and pushing a band too hard to write and record before they were ready and before they could possibly produce material of the quality they'd given us on Out of the Cellar. Again, guys in suits. Looking back, I really wish Rat would have told Atlantic Records president Doug Morris to go fuck himself when he told them they either let Bo Hill produce them or they don't get signed. Not because I have anything against Bo Hill as a producer, quite the opposite in fact, but because I think signing with Atlantic ruined Rat's career. Meanwhile, Motley signs with Elektra Records, takes two years between albums, 
and other than Theater of Pain, puts out some pretty consistently great albums, or at the very least, has a fair shot to do so each time. I mean, Girls and Feel Good basically pushed Motley all the way over the top because the material was strong enough to confirm what most of us loved about them from the beginning. While everything Rat releases after Seller unfortunately seems to have the opposite effect. Maybe if Rat had waited and signed with someone else, like Electra or Geffen, for instance, we'd be talking about a whole different result. I certainly like to think so, and I believe I'm right about that. On that note, when I think about 1986 in comparing Rat's career to Motley's, I can't help but hurt for these guys, at this point in particular. While Motley would put out an album every other year at best for pretty much the entire first half of their career, Rat released an album every year from 83 through 86. In 1985, the two bands had a rare meeting with Theater of Pain and Invasion of Your Privacy hitting shelves literally one week apart. With theater, Many of us absolute diehards had to forgive a lot, but most of us did. With Invasion, many of us were eventually going to realize we were a bit disappointed. Even though for me, Invasion has always been a better album than Theater of Pain. Yet, nobody I can remember ever actually said that out loud at the time. I'm not sure anyone even realized it at the time. Still, according to the logic that would seem to follow, you would think Rat would have caught Motley and maybe even been ready to surpass them. And then in 1986, when Dancing Undercover came out and Motley released, well, nothing, but instead left us with the less than pleasant taste from theater of pain in our mouths as they continued to tour, that's exactly when Rat should have blown by the crew. At least until Girls, Girls, Girls came out in 1987, right? And I mean, for those two full years, it's theater of crappy pain versus invasion of your privacy and dancing undercover. So what happened? Did Rat blow by their buddies? Well, no, they didn't. Okay, but why? I feel like I know the answer to that but I simply have no words I can seem to put together to adequately explain it. I do feel like part of the reason might be that with Invasion, you have the big single in Lay It Down, but not really the super high quality overall album. Then with Dancing Undercover, you have the super consistent, really solid album, but not the big single. I mean, I remember seeing these videos on all the video channels a lot back then. Like I said, especially Slip of the Lip for some reason, which seemed to get played every day. But none of the songs really ever caught on in a big way. And I mean, I don't remember ever hearing any of them on the actual radio. Meanwhile, Home Sweet Home was still all over MTV every day in 1986, and well beyond that, as I recall. I also find it interesting when I compare these guys and Motley 
just how differently they seem to approach things. Motley was much bigger and their fan base far more rabid, it seemed to me, but their albums and image were far less consistent than Rat's. Motley sounded and looked like a whole different band from one album to the next, with an almost entirely different approach to what they were doing. That was one of my favorite things about them. And it was possible because they had time to grow between albums. On Too Fast for Love, they were sort of like a hard rock punk band or a cross between Sweet, The Raspberries, Cheap Trick, and The Sex Pistols. On Shout, they were a much more classic metal band. Black and red, pentagrams and blood, simple drum beats, heavy guitar riffs, and screaming vocals from Vince. On theater, we suddenly had a shiny, sparkly, polka dot striped glam band with a far less aggressive, more blues oriented sound. Meanwhile, Rat sounded like pretty much the exact same band from one album to the next on a very steady path and progression in their look, their sound, and their writing, which is a fine thing if the material is consistently great and still continues to develop and catch people's attention, which I'm not sure after Lay It Down, it ever really did again. So what's the bottom line? For its rating, Dancing Undercover gets a total of 42 stars divided by 10 tracks, which equals 4.2 stars. As much as most of us seem to love this album, a lot of people will tell you this was the beginning of the end for Rat. I, meanwhile, will disagree. Invasion was the beginning of the end for Rat. And it was 100% Atlantic's fault. Dancing Undercover could have fixed all of that. But thanks to Atlantic, rushing them again, the album just wound up confirming it instead. Especially if you remember 1986, when Motley Crue didn't release anything at all, leaving the door very much open for someone else to at least temporarily take over the top of the Hard Rock Mountain. And rather than do that, rap very much faded into the background while bands like Bon Jovi, Cinderella, and Poison exploded. But what about 1988? How many five-star tracks do I think were on Reach for the Sky? What did I think of the tour which I saw? Tune in next time to find out, rat fans. <laughs>